Hello everyone and welcome to chapter 17 part 2b. Now let's start with this question. What processes can change allele frequency? Now last video we sort of talked about how natural selection can be that that um, that mechanism of evolution. So it is a way that evolution can proceed. But other than that, actually genetic drift and artificial selection also come in play. What is it exactly? Today we'll find out. So let's start with genetic drift, right? So genetic drift is caused by a random process due to chance, unlike natural selection. In natural selection, we're really talking about there's an environmental factor that is actually influencing who dies and who survives, right? And the individual that is best adapted to the environment will survive. But this one, it doesn't matter if you're adapted or not. It is a random process due to chance. And an example is the beetles down here, right? You can see. Now the beetles down here, um, there are nine of them, and just so happened that two beetles died, and they just happened to be green. It is by chance. It's not that the green beetles are more likely to be stepped on. It was an accident. It was a random process. And just by chance, again, by chance, but in a random process, uh, there is now less green beetles than brown beetles. And obviously, uh, you can say that the green color allele, coding for the beetle color here, right, has decreased in allele frequency in the following generation. Now, again, this this is a random process and therefore changes in allele frequencies usually fluctuate so a little bit up and down always in 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 nature due to random events and this cannot be predicted you cannot predict like the brown one gets step on more or the green one will step on more you cannot predict it is a random process again so this is normal i guess like you can be really good and be really adapted to the environment but stuff happens right anyways this affects small populations more than large population now this makes sense too because look there are nine individuals here in this population if two of the green beetles die that is a lot in proportion right two beetles out of nine is a lot However, if there's two beetles who died out of like a million beetles or a thousand beetles, right, that doesn't affect it as much. The allele frequency is not as affected. Therefore, again, it affects small populations more. When the population is small, there is a higher chance that the allele will be lost from the population. Okay, it's a, There's a higher chance that wiping out a few individuals may cost a loss of that allele okay it's just a little bit more okay if using a beetle example again it could be just stepping one more step in front that causes all three beetles to die and be lost from the population there's i'm not saying that definitely would happen there is a higher chance that would happen just wiping out three beetles could wipe out all the green alleles from this population can you imagine whereas in a large population you would have to stamp out a lot more you know what i'm saying so yeah so it affects small populations more now random events as i said uh, only cause really small effects if you can imagine it, if it's just like some wind that blows away a few ants for example or um uh, an accident that happen to animals for example these usually cause really small effects because it only affects a few random individuals here and there right but um, there are some cases where random events cause a big effects. For example, migration. So in this case, this type of genetic drift, we call it the founder effect. Or like a natural disaster. A huge thing that happens that causes many individuals to die at once. And that is called the bottleneck effect. And we're going to investigate them closer right now so let's start with the founder effect so what is the founder effect again it is caused by migration and the idea is uh, it has a big effect because only a few individuals from the original population or here it's labeled ancestral population same thing now this few individuals would move to a new region maybe you know got on a ship accidentally got off anyways now 
This few individuals move to a new region and become geographically isolated from the larger population. This new population is established by only a small number of individuals though. And this is the problem because you can see here like in the butterfly example, the picture here, there is brown, orange and white butterflies in a certain proportion. But you can see by chance, uh, the butterflies that moved over to the new region is two brown butterflies and one orange butterfly. There is no white butterflies and there is a higher proportion of brown butterflies than orange butterflies. So how do we say this in proper terms? We say that it only carries a fraction of the alleles from the original population. It has a different allele frequency from the original population. The gene pool of this new region, the new population, may not be representative of the gene pool of the original population. This ratio of brown, yellow, sorry, brown, orange, white butterflies is not the same as the ratio in the new region. Again, there's no white butterflies, there's only some brown butterflies. Therefore, there's no white alleles, a lot more brown allele, and only some orange alleles. So again, gene pool is not the same as the original population. And as you can see also, this results in a lower genetic diversity than the original population. This this new population has lost the white allele. Now over time, this causes a big effect because over time, population might become genetically more distinct from the original population. The allele frequencies will change, they might be affected by more uh, different environmental conditions and over many, many generations, I'm talking thousands of years, hundreds of years, then maybe it might develop into a separate species in a process called speciation. Okay, change of allele frequency a little bit, a little bit over a long time makes a huge difference. Now more on speciation later on, don't worry about it so much. This is just the founder effect. That's it. Okay, so moving on to the next thing, which is the bottleneck effect bottleneck effect right is the idea that there is a large decrease in genetic diversity due to a large decrease in population numbers very suddenly this is common when natural disasters occur you can see it's called a bottleneck effect because of the shape of the bottle it's like there's a quite <clears throat> there's quite a wide base but the neck is usually more narrow. So you can see it represented here. We have the original population represented in green, red, and orange balls. And um, through the bottlenecking event, only a few survive. And you can see here, um, most of the population do not survive. Large decrease in population numbers. And therefore, the allele frequency has changed. The red color allele here, Okay, has been lost from the population. Now, this is common when natural disasters occur. So, natural disasters is an example of a bottlenecking event, an event that causes this large decrease in numbers. Uh, but also, it can occur due to overhunting, human activities, overfishing, destruction of the habitat, and uh, basically, it's our fault. Now, okay, so <clears throat> this occurs in 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 naturally as well as not so naturally anyways um let's describe it further in proper terms right so again you can see there's a small group of survivors and again the gene pool will not be representative of the gene pool in the original population as i said as you look here in this diagram um red allele here has been lost from the population it's not that the red fella did anything wrong or is anything less adapted is it it's just by chance this is why it's called genetic drift it is a random process that the red allele is lost and what results what is res, what is the result is a limited gene pool compared to previous population 
Now you might say, oh, okay, then we should do some conservation effort and let's say uh, increase your population number in the zoo and breed many of them and return them to the wild. Well, this is good and it will increase population number, but something that we cannot help is that it does not increase genetic diversity. We cannot make more diverse for example, pandas. We can increase the population of pandas, but because they started off from that few small group of survivors, everyone will be sort of like related and close in genetic diversity. Okay, we cannot make the pandas more diverse, okay, by ourselves. Anyway, the nature has to help over thousands and millions of years. Anyways, is that such a bad thing? And the answer is yes, because low genetic diversity, as we have talked about in variation, means that the animal, the individual, maybe the population is susceptible to disease. They all have the same resistance because they are so genetically similar. So maybe if a disease comes and wipes out the population, uh, most of them will not be able to survive. So we'll learn more about this next chapter. Next chapter is about um, the ecosystem. So we'll talk about it more then. Interesting stuff. But anyways, that's it for genetic drift. Now, moving on to the next thing that causes change in allele frequency. Artificial selection. Again, there are three things that causes change in allele frequency that you have known so far. Actually, there's more, but there's three you've learned so far. Number one is natural selection. Number two is genetic drift. And this includes the founder effect and the bottleneck effect. And number three is artificial selection. So artificial selection. So artificial selection is also called selective breeding and you may have heard of this already. This is the process where individuals with desired features are selected to breed by humans. So humans are the selection pressure here. How crazy is that? That is so different from natural selection, right? Now we are the selection pressure instead of the environmental factor. So this is the process. Number one, humans choose parents with desirable features. For example, um, I think these are maybe sugar cane plants, right? These tall sugar plane plants are desired. So we choose them and we breed them together. Plants can be crossbred as well. And as a result, um, they have many offspring. So within the offspring, we select the offspring again with the desirable feature. So we maybe take the tallest one of these and then we cross them again and we repeat this for many, many generations until all the plants we get are wonderfully tall. So that's our desirable features. Now this desirable feature can differ. Okay, it can be different for different organisms, different plants, different uh, animals. Okay. So, but the process is the same. We choose what we want, we cross them, we choose what we want again, we cross them again, and we repeat this many, many generations. This causes an increase in allele frequency for ideal characteristics and a decrease in frequency for undesired alleles. And it makes sense because you're only crossing the ones that you want uh, the, the ones with ideal characteristics. So only the alleles for ideal characteristics will be passed on. Now there are disadvantages to this, if you think about it. Because this means, okay, if you cross the offspring with each other all the time, this means they're very inbred. <laughs> Can you imagine doing it to dogs? And that's exactly what happened, right? Taking dogs that are cute and maybe docile a little bit more, cross them together after many, many generations with all their siblings. Okay, everyone's related. Everyone's inbred. So what is the problem with that? So this results in increased homozygosity and therefore harmful recessive alleles may be expressed because if most of them are homozygous, they could be homozygous recessive for certain alleles and that may be expressed, okay? Um, and this causes inbreeding depression, what we call it, loss of hybrid figure. 
This causes a limited gene pool. It causes a decrease in genetic variation. And uh, yes, your offspring may show desired traits after many generations, but it may not be well adapted to its environment anymore. So, one classic example is the pug. The pug is a cute dog with a very flat face, okay, and this is inbred. This is uh, artificially selected over many, many generations. I'm talking about hundreds of years since human beings have dogs at speed as pets and uh, honestly it's a dog with many problems it is very very cute a little bit ugly but very very cute um and it has a lot of problems okay it has eyes that really bulgy it has m many um breathing problems it has this malformed spine and wing hind legs it has this skin folds that may lead to irritation and infection it overheats during exercise because its fur coat is too thick and it has a high blood pressure and this is all due to inbreeding depression it's so inbred they are so genetically problematic that it has all these issues <laughs> don't buy pugs adopt Okay, don't buy. But anyways, talking about pugs, um yeah, it it this means that the pug doesn't is not well adapted to the environment because can you imagine if the pug has breathing problems and overheats during exercise and has all this this uh physical problems? This means it cannot run very fast or for a very long time. It it wheezes, okay, it has wheezing sounds when um, it's overworked. It's, it's, a, it's a cute dog. It's just a bit sad and needs a lot of care and attention, okay? Okay, again, don't buy. Please adopt. Please don't promote inbreeding. Anyways, so this is a problem of artificial selection. I hope that, like, gives you a mental image of what problems it may cause anyways let's do a little comparison here so that you know for sure what is the difference between artificial selection and natural selection in artificial like sex there artificial selection can't speak today humans are the selection pressure is selected for human benefit the feature is for human benefit not for survival whereas in natural selection it's due to the environmental selection pressure okay this is selected feature for the organism's benefit because the organism the individuals they are best adapted survive and reproduce and this promotes survival promotes evolution right this promotes being adapted to the environment artificial selection doesn't have that but it does benefit us i guess well it has other problems too right when it comes to this and we talk about it later but artificial selection as we talked about just now <clears throat> causes inbreeding and lower genetic diversity resulting in inbreeding depression and increased homozygosity if you flip that around that means decreased heterozygosity okay and you can see natural selection is everything opposite to that in artificial selection <clears throat> Isolation mechanisms, which you haven't learned about yet, are not operating. Whereas in natural selection, isolation mechanisms do operate. And isolation mechanisms are uh, do result in speciation, the formation of new species later. Don't worry about it. We will cover it later. However, um, artificial selection is usually faster. And natural selection is usually slower. Because artificial selection is... Um, facilitated it's facilitated by human beings and is not up to the environment you get what i'm saying so let's learn a few examples <clears throat> there are four examples of artificial selection and you do need to know all four this is in your syllabus is written in your syllabus like this exactly so you do need to know this okay and, and i'll give you little examples of artificial selection other than that. The process is quite the same. You just need to know what traits are desired. So for example, in the milk yield of dairy cattle, this is something we want to improve. This is the desired traits. Other than that, increased docility or calm temperament. You don't want an angry cow. You want a nice cute cow that obeys the instructions, sort of. Fast growth 
growth room rates, high milk yield, fat rich milk, high fertility, disease resistance. And this, of course, is um, differs based on what cows you are trying to produce. So if you're trying to produce dairy cows, sorry, if you're trying to produce milk, then you'll use dairy cows, which have already been selected over many, many hundreds of years for this process. And beef cows are different, just so you know. Okay, there are many different types. You can do some research. Anyways, uh, for all of these different desired traits, it's the same idea. You breed individuals by collecting sperm from the bull. Wonderful. And you can freeze it and use later, or you can freeze it and you can just use now. And then you artificially inseminate the defroster semen into the cow during its fertile period. Cow is the female cattle, yeah. And basically, you insert that sperm into the cow, and then you're pretty much done. Okay, and you can avoid inbreeding, honestly, um, all the, the bad effects of artificial selection by referring to the pedigree records. When we talk, what's pedigree records? You know, the pedigree diagram that I've shown you in last chapter, the one with the circle and the squares, you know. Usually in a farm, they will keep a record of who bred with who and who how the cows are related to each other. And you can avoid inbreeding by only mating the cows that are not so related to each other. So it's less inbreeding. They must be further related. So yeah, um, of course you do this, this, um, this process with bulls and cows with the desired trait you want. So you pick the cow and bull with the desired trait, you, you do this process, okay, and then they have offspring and you do the same thing to the offspring. So that is cows. Let's talk about crop improvement. So crop like C-R-O-P. So we're talking about food, wheat, rice, vegetables, etc. So mainly here is wheat and rice. So wheat or triticum estivum, you see this scientific name a lot really in papers and in exams, right? In wheat, we want them to be disease resistant, particularly to fungal diseases. Uh, one of the popular ones is wheat rust and the reason why it's called rust is because it looks like rust but actually is a fungal disease. For rice, or Oryza sativa, satisfying rice, I, th I say, um, I love the scientific name for rice. I find it very satisfying, no pun intended. Anyways, moving on. Rice, we want it to have a resistance to bacterial and fungal diseases. Uh, rice is quite prone to these diseases as well. There's many sorts of diseases for them. Bacteria blight, spots, smuts, and rice blast, basically. They're like either lines or patches or dots okay and that's how they differentiate the diseases and um yeah you don't need to remember any of that but the idea is that you want to avoid that so what do you do you do the same process as we mentioned just now you take the wheat that seem to be resistant to these fungal diseases you cross them and you use the offspring okay and you cross the offspring that show some resistance as well and this is done over many many generations so actually the crops that we have now in farms are much more resistant to these diseases than what used to be a hundred thousands years of years ago okay so we have the improved version because people of the past generations ago have done their job anyways other than disease resistance which is a very important example. These are other desired traits in crop improvement you should look out for. So in wheat, um, higher yield, so bigger year. So this is a year of wheat, this is what we call, and each year of wheat has grains. So more grains per year of wheat or bigger grains in the years of wheat would be great for higher yield. Fast grow rates is very ideal. Tolerance to high temperature because, hey, global warming is a thing so you want them to be able to grow in higher temperature pest resistance um, as well as specialized gluten rich grain <clears throat> for right for bread flour so in bread bread making 
maybe some of you would relate over MCO, right? A lot of people have been breaking bread. You use high protein flour. And high protein flour actually comes from from bread flour, um, sorry, for uh, specialized wheat that are artificially selected to be gluten rich. Ta da! Now you know. Okay, moving on to the next example. So, other than all of those traits, we actually want this one more interesting trait. We want dwarf varieties. <laughs> we want shorter stem dwarf varieties in wheat. And this is a very special sort of desired property. Why? Because if it's shorter, it means greater proportion of energy is put into the grain instead of the height. So a higher yield. So the plant won't focus on just growing tall. It will just grow to a certain height and then have more grain. Great. And also, if it's shorter, it's less susceptible to being knocked over by weather and there's less waste, less straw produced. So how do we do this? Okay, by artificial selection. Same thing. But what we didn't know is while doing the crossing, so we chose shorter stem dwarf varieties and crossed them to produce more dwarf plants, we actually were doing this. We were actually incorporating mutant alleles for gibberellin synthesis into wheat by un unknowingly. What we were doing is we were stopping the production of gibberellin, which stimulates stem elongation. Okay, the mutant alleles are of the reduced height gene, where because you know it makes sense. <laughs> the mutant alleles cause reduced height. And these mutant alleles actually code for faulty enzymes in the gibberellin synthesis pathway and therefore inhibit gibberellin synthesis. And therefore, if you inhibit gibberellin synthesis, go back and revise your uh, chapter 15 sort of plant hormone bit. But what gibberellin does is it breaks down Della protein, which is some sort of repressor. So what happens if you inhibit gibberellin is that Della protein is not broken down and continues to bind to a transcriptor PIF, and therefore this inhibits the transcription of growth genes, keeping the plants short. It is a dwarf variety. Now, just in case you were lazy to refer, I have attached a slide to process right here. But I'm not going to go through it. You read it. You can pause the video right now. Read it and like sort of refresh and rewind a bit if you must. Okay, moving on to the next bit. One last example. Inbreeding and hybridization of maize. Now, maize, scientific name, Z maize, completely makes sense. I love that name, by the way. Anyways, maize um, has a problem. The problem is that there's inbreeding. Inbreeding, it, as a result of artificial selection, leads to uniformity, which is good. You want it to be all the same size. Easier to harvest, looks pretty, whatnot, easier to sell. But inbreeding has problems, as we have learned just now. Increase in homozygosity, Right, would lead to inbreeding depression. Homozygous plants are less vigorous than heterozygous ones. And these homozygous plants have more harmful recessive alleles expressed. And therefore, over time, over each generation, it tends to become smaller and weaker. Okay, again, this is called inbreeding depression. And yeah, there is a problem. So what is the solution? And the most uh, intuitive solution would be, oh, okay, then we'll outbreed them. But so, well, outbreeding does cause heterozygous plants to be produced and they're healthier and they grow taller and have high yields, but there's no uniformity. So it's very hard to harvest and sell. So what is the solution here? The solution, where someone has very, very cleverly found out, is inbreeding and hybridization. What does it mean? Okay, so companies has discovered this. So companies use inbreeding to produce homozygous maize plants of desired traits for many generations. So 
For example, you have inbred A and inbred B here, and you basically make them purebred for many generations already, and you keep them in the company, yeah, in the lab. And okay, they have more kernels, maybe bigger kernels, okay, the corn kernel, uh, higher yield, etc. So you crossbreed those two, cross pollinate them. And result in hybridization and this produce F1 seeds okay so it doesn't become the plant yet produces F1 seeds so what they do is they sell these seeds to the farmers the farmers buy these F1 seeds and plant them all of F1 are hybrids as we know they are all heterozygotes so they all have the same genotype and they are uniform and has hybrid vigor Yay! So what do you do if you want to plant them again? You buy more seeds from the companies who do the work for you and then you plant them again. So you have solved both problems. Number one, it's not inbred. There's no inbreeding depression here. Okay. And number two, it's uniform in size, easy to harvest, easy to sell the yield, the, the corn kernels. Ta -da. And that's it. That is the last example of artificial selection. See you next video. Bye!